Okay. Uh, for those of you who aren't already aware, Dr. Edward Wine obtained his PhD in biochemical engineering from the University of Toronto in a career very impressively spanning more than 30 years as a senior food research scientist and administrator. He's developed many healthy and unique nutritional foods and supplements, both for mind and body. Uh, these included the world's first full nutritional meal replacement product and groundbreaking nutrition bar to maintain memory and cognitive health. Dr. Wine has also served as adjunct professor at the University of Guelph in Canada, was on the advisory board of Ryerson University Department of Chemical Engineering, and is a past member of the Canada Expert Committee on Food Biotechnology. He was the contributing author of the nutrition chapter to Dr. Paul Bendheim's MD's book, The Brain Training Revolution, circa 2009. His latest book available January 2020 is The Brain Boosting Diet, Feed Your Memory, a brain health guide and cookbook with over 200 recipes by renowned cookbook author Noreen Gillitz, Zichrona Libracha. The Brain Boosting Diet book was a joint effort between Ed and Noreen. They were co-authors and, and um, behind the, the beauty behind this amazing book that we all are enjoying now. The book itself is a combination of health cookbook approach with the first part of the book being the science behind the recipes. And um, he's gonna share, I think, a bit of that science with us today and the recipe development process. The second part of the book is Noreen's recipes and comments, along with a section called Dr. Ed Says, with useful tips and facts for each recipe. Uh, Ed is also a longtime member at our synagogue Beth Tikva. He's also led Torah study groups, Shiva Minions, and a whole lot more. You can often find him in the sanctuary on Yom Tov and Shabbat morning services. Without further ado, I present Ed Wine. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Sigal, and uh, thank you, Rezi and Chavara, for inviting me. Uh, let me just put up the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, there we go. And just want to go on the slideshow. Okay, we're all set. So I just, uh, just for your information, when Noreen and I first discussed the concept of the uh, Brain Boosting Diet book, we were encouraged by one simple fact, and that was that medical science has made a lot of progress in prevention and treatment of all the major diseases that we have in mankind, you know, from uh, heart, you know, heart health, heart disease, uh, diabetes, cancer. The only disease that has made essentially zero progress is dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they've tried about 250 different drugs to try to treat Alzheimer's, all failed. There's only about a one or two or three drugs that are on the market now, and they don't really treat your Alzheimer's, they just uh, improve your symptoms somewhat. But I can tell you that they're not very effective based on my own experience with my mother, you know, who uh, died of Alzheimer's. So because of that, people had looked at lifestyle as a means of preventing and slowing down cognitive decline. And uh, chief among the lifestyle features is diet. Now, people out there, uh, because they know that there's no medical treatment, including no surgery, no uh, medical devices that they can use, what they've done is they look for their own lifestyle. And here's one. Doesn't work. He bought a new pair of shoes with memory foam insoles, no more forgetting why I walked into the kitchen. That doesn't work very well. So for today's talk, we'll basically look at the highlights of the brain boosting diet. 
And it's really the science and cuisine of brain healthy eating. Part one, as Sigal mentioned, is the science behind the recipes. Part two is the smart cuisine recipes uh, formulated by Noreen Gillis with some commentary by myself. What we're gonna talk about today is listed here. We're gonna first talk about memory loss and cognitive decline. We'll see who gets it, why they get it. We're gonna see how horrible the disease is. And then we're gonna look at risk factors for Alzheimer's and dementia and how we can improve on those. Once we focused on diet, we're gonna look at the three deadly sins of our current North American diet, what we're doing wrong today. Once we've done that, we'll go into foods that help, foods that hurt the brain. Then what we will do is we'll pull it all together with menu plans and then optimizing the diet through different processing and smart combinations. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about supplements and whether they do any good. I'll also give you an example of a typical recipe in the book that Noreen has put together. And we won't, there's 200 of them, so I can't go through all of them, but we can give you an overview of what Noreen has done and the breakdown of uh, the different segments of recipes. So that's what we're gonna to do today. The main form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. It affects your thinking, your concentration, your memory, judgment, and ultimately it impedes a person's ability to form their normal daily activities. Here's some interesting quotes to think about. Mark Twain said, of all the things I've lost, I miss memory the most. Why did he say that? Think about it. Memory is based on your, your knowledge is based on memory, your education, your relationships with people, your ability to solve problems and plan is based also on memory. Everything, it's your ID. So if you lose memory, you've lost all those issues. It's a terrible um, disease to have because of that. Interestingly enough, it also affects our religious interaction. I was able to find a quote in our Machsor by Abraham Joshua Heschel. And he said to us, recollection is a holy act. We sanctify the present by remembering the past. To us Jews, the essence of faith is memory. To believe is to remember. If you don't remember our history, how can you identify as a Jew? The other major quote, is eat, I love this one, eat your food as your medicines, otherwise you have to eat medicines as your food. For those of us who have a plethora of medications we have to take, I think we can relate to that. Um, and it's becoming increasingly important as we do further research that food can replace a lot of medications. So what should we know about dementia and Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's disease represents about 45 to 80 percent of all dementia and the memory loss is the primary symptom. Why is it such a wide range? Because the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease versus the other dementias is still a work in progress. Uh, it's not perfected yet so you look up different studies they'll give you a different range but the average we see is that 70% of all dementias are Alzheimer's, and that's what really we should focus on. One in 10 people, 65 plus, has Alzheimer's disease, and interestingly enough, about two-thirds to 70% are women. Why? We're not sure, but one reason could be that women live longer. And because Alzheimer's is a disease of age, this could be part of the explanation. Because look, 40 to 50% of people, 85 plus, have Alzheimer's disease. It's interesting, in Asia, they have less incidence of Alzheimer's disease, and that 40 to 50% doesn't start until the age of 90. Alzheimer's is the fifth leading cause of death for people 65 plus. There's no cure and very marginal therapy. Okay, so this is an interesting slide because it tells you what 
proportion of people aged 75 to 84 with Alzheimer's or dementia by race or ethnicity. The biggest number is the Spanish, 27.9%, amazing, compared to white people at 10.9%. African-American is also very high. Part of the reason for Hispanic, by the way, is that they live longer than us. So that explains a little bit because as they age, they're more prone to uh, getting Alzheimer's. This is an important slide because it shows how women are especially prone to getting Alzheimer's disease. In her 60s, a woman's estimated lifetime risk is one in six for developing Alzheimer's. But for breast cancer, it's only one in 11. So you have a higher risk of getting Alzheimer's than breast cancer. Almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. If you take a world view, it's almost 70%. There are 2.5 times more women than men providing intensive on-duty care 24 hours a day for someone with Alzheimer's. And more than 60% of Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers are women. So it's something that women are intimately involved with. This is a slide that shows you the different types of dementia. Alzheimer's is just one of the types of dementia. So you have Alzheimer's disease, which is about 70% average. Uh, this tells you the symptoms. You can read it for yourself. The next type of dementia is vascular dementia, you know, where you have a hardening of the arteries, you have strokes, you have uh, uh, blood vessel uh, defects in the brain, and that also is important. Then you have mixed dementia, which is a combination of all of them, and I think a lot of it is because they can't diagnose what it is exactly. And we have what they call Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia is uh, similar to Alzheimer's, but it's the primary form for Parkinson's patients. And Parkinson's patients have this Lewy bodies, which is a protein that's embedded in their uh, neurons, which uh, cause their symptoms. They have different symptoms than Alzheimer's, and it's, uh, they have uh, movement disabilities, they have hallucinations, which is a little different than what Alzheimer's has. So there you have a mixed bag. By the way, I should just mention that vascular dementia and Lewy body, the numbers keep varying. And now the current thinking is that they're about the same. So the main point to get out of this slide is that Alzheimer's is the one to focus on. This is the pathology of Alzheimer's. So there's four things we know about it. One is that you have plaques, and neurofibrillar tangles in the cells, neurons. The plaques are outside the cells. Both of them are proteins, but they impede the functioning of the brain. This is the area where most, most of the um, research has been done and where most of the studies of the 250 drugs has been focused on with little effect. So what's happening is people are now saying, Maybe the plaques and neurofibrillar tangles aren't the cause of the Alzheimer's, they're a result. And they're focusing now on two things. One is inflammation, when uh, the immune system goes a little bit amok and you get a high level of chronic inflammation, which affects the brain. And the other is decreased glucose metabolism. This is a very important concept. It's becoming um, very current in scientific theory and it's uh, leading to what they call type three diabetes of the brain. The, interestingly enough, both these areas where the research is focused is where diet can do the most good. And I'll explain that as we go along. The other pathology, cerebral atrophy, you can't do much about. They've noticed that the brain shrinks as you get uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. It doesn't happen all of a sudden. You have a little bit between birth and the age of 40, you have preclinical symptoms. The brain changes, but you don't see the symptoms, or an individual may notice a change. He may forget a meeting, he may forget his keys, you know, when he goes to the car. The patient knows, but the doctor doesn't yet. So that's the preclinical. That leads to another phase, which is called mild 
cognitive impairment. There, the cognitive changes of concern to the individual and or the family. Um, you know, you forget uh, a person that you've met in the morning or a meeting, you don't remember what the meeting was about. Uh, but the key differential between that and dementia is you can still go on with your normal activities of life. You don't need a caregiver to take care of you. That, by the way, and mild cognitive impairment can stay as such, not leading to dementia, but oftentimes it does. And once you have the dementia, that's where you have a lot of problems. You know, it doesn't matter if you forget that you have your car keys in your pocket. What matters is if you forget that you put the car keys in the fridge. That's where your thought processes start to diminish. So it gets worse and worse so that it interferes with everyday abilities, things like problem solving, planning. You can't uh, fill out a checkbook. You can't uh, plan things. Uh, and that gets worse and worse until ultimately you die because uh, there are side effects like you forget how to swallow, you forget how to do things, you fall, ultimately you can die. You know, it's interesting. Um, I belong to a small group called the Romeo Club where we meet uh, once a week uh, in a restaurant. And we had a member of the group who developed early onset Alzheimer's. And one of the key characteristics of that, where we started to realize, because he would speak normally, but he would always show up late for the, dip, for the breakfast. And finally, we found out why. He couldn't remember how to get to the restaurant. That's Alzheimer's. Here's the risk factors for Alzheimer's and dementia. Depression is very important for both. And it's more important for late life than for midlife. Physical, physical inactivity is very important. Exercise is critical. Cognitive inactivity is also important. You gotta use your brain or you lose it. Hypertension is also important. Uh, as for dementia, not so, we don't have much data for um, Alzheimer's. And in later life, hypotension uh, is uh, a greater risk uh, than hypertension. Obesity, a major risk factor. Uh, but in later life, if you're underweight, it's a greater risk. Why? Because you usually have other disease morbidities. So that results in your losing weight or whatever, and that uh, is why it's a greater risk. Type 2 diabetes is a risk. Smoking is a risk. But the best one is poor diet. There's a wide range. Why? 30 to 90 percent increased risk for poor diet. The reason is if you it's hard to define a healthy diet. A Mediterranean type diet is not a very defined object. You know, there's all kinds of different foods that can go into a Mediterranean type diet. For sure it's healthy, but you can make it more healthy. And age is also important. When you start the diet, the earlier you start, the younger you are, the more impact it has. There was one study from Sweden where they started on 50 year olds and they got a 90% reduction in risk when they switched to a healthy diet. These risk factors can be broken down in ones that can be changed, can't be changed, and ones that can be changed. You can't change your age, and the older you get, the more the risk. Having a genetic um, a malformation of having a APOE4 gene, as they call it, increases your risk of uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, not much you can do about that. Low education level, although as you try to learn more when you're older, that improves that of someone. And diabetes, although now we do have some means of controlling diabetes. What can we change? Diet, depression, physical exercise, hypertension, mental exercise, midlife obesity, and smoking. What's interesting is that diet also impacts on hypertension. With your diet, you can control hypertension or high blood pressure. You can control obesity. 
and you can control triglycerides, high cholesterol. You can also control depression. A lot of healthy foods will lower your risk of depression. So diet not only impacts because of the foods that you eat, but also its impact on other risk factors. Okay, so now we can look at three deadly dietary sins of our North American diet. But before we go on, I'm going to pause the uh, slides and see if there's any questions at this point. Uh, if I put the stop share, well, I could just leave it at that. Sigal, is that okay? No, I can pause. Okay, there we go. Eddie, I want to know why, uh, how diet can affect depression. There I think depression foods. is a clinical entity that uh, is in itself can occur, but I'm not sure if it, if uh, diet can uh, improve or or create or cause depression. So I'm curious about your answer. There are certain foods that have been shown to improve depression symptoms, and some of them uh, e equivalent to drugs. Uh, for example, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, which are found in fish, uh, can reduce depression. And I can uh, show you the papers on that, but it's in the book also, uh, which I believe you have. So you can look up the references, which are in chapter six, I believe, and uh, you'll be able to see uh, several references where they point out how foods can improve depression symptoms. Any other questions? Okay, so let's go on with, uh, ah, here we go, share screen. Let's go back. Okay, there we go. Uh, it takes me right to the beginning. Okay, let's go back to the three deadly dietary sins. Okay, the first di deadly dietary sin is we eat too much. And this is a beautiful slide that was actually from a, <laughs> uh, the military in the US. And they compare the serving sizes in the 50s with serving sizes today. A soda in the 50s was seven ounces, now it's 42. A hamburger was 3.9 ounces, now it's 12 ounces. French fries, 2.4 ounces, 6.7 now. You know, everything has gotten supersized. Doesn't help us. This is another <laughs> uh, interesting slide. In the 90s, we were skinny, the TVs were fat. Now we're fat, the TVs are skinny. Don't listen to some of the hype that's out there. Well, what do we learn from cows, buffaloes, and elephants? It's impossible to reduce weight by eating green grass and salads and walking. Not true. <laughs> if you eat grass, salads, leafy vegetables, and salads and walking, you will lose weight. The second deadly dietary sin, too much sugar and carbs. I can't stress this one enough. It used to be believed that it was fat that used to cause and maintain a lot of the chronic diseases. Now the thinking has shifted from fats to sugars and carbs. Keep in mind, it's not the sugar itself that's at fault. Sugar is made up of two molecules. One is glucose, the other is fructose. Carbohydrates also are long chain glucose molecules linked together. When you take it into the body, the body breaks it down and produces glucose, which is your main energy source for both the body and the brain. It seems a little bit odd. The brain is only about, uh, I think it's about three ounces. No, three pounds, three pounds. And yet it consumes 20% of the energy consumed by the body. So you would think that, hey, cutting back on glucose is not a good idea. But the problem is because it uses so much glucose, if the insulin response is degraded or the metabolism of the glucose is degraded in the brain, 
that's when you run into problems because then you have a high concentration of glucose and all the problems that's manifested because of it. Uh, one of which is that the breakdown products from glucose result in inflammatory conditions, which is thought to be now a major cause of Alzheimer's. The reason we focus on sugar, because we consume so much of it. We consider it now the new tobacco. 74% of processed foods have added sugar. Things like I would never think about. You know, you look at ketchup, it has sugar. You look at soups, they have sugar. You look at the labels, sugar is in a lot of things. The US recommends no more than 10% of calories come from sugar. Europe and the World Health Organization, Health Organization recommend no more than 5%. But only 20% of Americans consume less than 10%. And in UK, average consumption is about 15% sugars. They represent 20% of the total calories of junk food, like soda, juices, ice cream, cakes, candies, etc. And something you should know is that manufacturers try to disguise sugar. They call it agave syrup, sugar, evaporated cane juice, sugar, corn syrup, sugar, and there's all kinds of other names too. Where does it come from, all this consumption of sugar? If we look at added sugar, the biggest consumption is soft drinks, and many jurisdictions are now introducing legislation to limit uh, the sale of soft drinks to schools, et cetera. But if you look at total sugar consumption, this is a surprising fact. Fruits are 17.4%, the biggest number of, of, of sugar consumption. So although fruits are healthy, you eat too many of them, you're just asking for trouble. So what can we do about it? Well, lower the sugar fruit option and go to options such as berries. Berries have much less sugar than other fruits. And go to moderate consumption of high sugar fruits. You know, things like watermelon or, or, or uh, peaches or oranges. So you, you don't go overboard on those. Soft drinks, well, you can replace those with diet drinks, unsweetened tea, coffee or nut milks. By the way, unsweetened tea, coffee or nut milks have been shown to be beneficial to prevent Alzheimer's because of the antioxidants they contain. Brown and white sugar, well, you can go for sugar substitutes uh, or unsweetened foods. Milk, go to almond milk or other nut milks and moderate the amount of milk that you consume. Fruit juice, eat fruit instead of juice, because at least with fruit, you get the fiber, you get other nutrients. With fruit juice, it's just calories and sugar. So try, you know, you gotta moderate your fruit intake, but leave out the fruit juice. One very important fact, carbs are just as harmful as sugars because they're also made up of glucose. And here's two very important papers, which really put the research community on its, on its toes. There was one study called the Rosebud study, showed 25, top 25% of people who took in carbs resulted in 89% risk of dementia and MCI. But the top 25% of fat intake resulted in a 44% reduction in dementia and MCI. So again, as I mentioned before, fat is not the culprit, sugars and carbs are. The only difference is that saturated fats are still a question mark. Unsaturated fats, I think you'll find that there's a consensus in the scientific community, they're good for you. But saturated fats, no. There was another study, a pure study, that showed that the top 20% of carb intake had a 28% increased mortality. That means death from all sources, as compared to the bottom 20% of carb intake. And the same way they show that the top 20% of fat intake had a 23% reduced risk of mortality. So again, it shows you carbs are bad, unsaturated fats are good. I don't know how many people are familiar with glycemic index. It's a measure of how fast 
the foods are converted to glucose in the body. And what they do is they take glucose as a reference and they make it 100. And then anything close to 100 is as bad as glucose. So they take different foods and they measure how fast it's converted into glucose in the body, which is a measure of how risky it is. What's surprising about this table is that you look at white bread, there's a 75% glycemic index, so close to glucose. Look at sugar, sucrose. It's less than white bread. Why? Because sugar is only half glucose. The other half is fructose. With white bread, the carbon's all glucose, just in chains. But the surprise is if you go to the whole grain bread, the whole wheat, you don't get much of a change. And the reason for that is because it contains such a high load of carbohydrates that even the fiber doesn't make a difference. Same thing with white rice and brown rice, 73 and 68. Not much of a difference. Spaghetti is an odd one. Fairly low, maybe because of the processing, it's not converted into glucose as easily. Oat porridge, again, same thing. 79, cornflakes, 81. The lowest levels of conversion to glucose are beans, chickpeas, soya beans, the, any beans, very low, very healthy. So that gives you an idea. Number three, the three deadly sins. Too much processed foods. These are foods that have undergone changes in manufacturing plants. So what they'll do, they'll take a beautiful whole grain wheat and they'll convert it to these pops, which are basically just carbohydrate, digestible carbohydrate, not fiber, and sugar. So when people complain, what they do is they add back some vitamins or some other nutrients, but you can't make it whole again. Once you've extracted the uh, carbohydrates from the wheat and added the sugar and whatnot, you can't add back the vitamins, the minerals, the fiber, and get back to the original form. You know, I mean, it's crazy. So we should watch out for highly processed foods. About 80% of the foods on the market shelves today didn't exist 100 years ago, according to uh, one neurosurgeon and author. Ultra-processed foods, which I talked about earlier, which are the junk foods, contain high levels of sugar, fat, salt, and additives and contribute 90% of added sugar, 50% of calories to the diet. By the way, the reason you have these junk foods is because our body was designed to crave sugar, fat, and salt. So it's, it's, it's uh, a real effort to try to wean ourselves off of that. Okay, so that's, uh, that's that chapter. Are there any questions? Anybody has a question, you can put your hand up or just Ed, on mute. Hi, Ed, it's Mike here. Um, I think we're frozen. Can you hear oh, me? Are you okay? Okay, so let's go back. Can you, can you hear me now? I um, can hear you. Okay, you, you mentioned with the whole wheat, I've always been taught that whole wheat bread is always superior to like the white or, or enriched white. Um, but what you're saying is from, in the basis of sugar, it's not. But is there anything, any other redeeming qualities that, yeah. in other words, should I be cutting out whole wheat bread? That's, that's my question, basically. No, you could, if you're gonna eat bread, you still should eat whole wheat bread. Why? Because it does contain fiber. And fiber is good for, uh, uh, you know, motility in the colon, you know, to get uh, regularity. Um, the fiber, uh, the whole wheat bread also contains some vitamins and minerals uh, that are not, in the white bread itself. So you are getting some nutritional value from the fiber you don't get from white bread. However, as regards the bad effects of sugar, not much difference. Right. So if you need to have bread, focus on the whole wheat or whole grain, actually. Eddie? Okay. Uh, yeah. Eddie? It's yeah. a shame again. I hate to bother you, but. Um, are you telling me I should give up my cornflakes and have a, have a couple of scrambled eggs instead? 
But yes. you go from, from carbohydrates to fats? You know what? I'm in the same boat as you. I like bread. So what I do is I, I like cornflakes. I take a half a slice of bread in the morning, I toast it, and I put on some butter or whatever, uh, margarine actually, which is better. So yeah, I, I just limit the amount of carbohydrates I have. And in the book, you'll, I actually put in recommendations for what levels of carbohydrates you should go to. Doesn't mean you have to leave them out completely. If you do that, you're at an Atkins diet, you're in a ketogenic diet. And uh, the ketogenic diet, I believe, starts out at 20 grams a day of carbs and eventually works up to 50 to 100. So you can have some carbs, but don't overdo it. That's okay. what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Uh, okay. You know what? You can pause it, but uh, unfortunately, I don't see a unpause, so I'll have to share the screen again. Too bad. Okay. Uh, speaker view. No. Okay, let's go into the uh, share screen. Okay. Okay, there we go. So now we can go into foods that help and foods that hurt the brain. Okay, so this is. Uh, the food group, what should we should look for, especially within leafy grains and vegetables, which are the best ones and why the good stuff inside. Leafy greens and other select vegetables like cruciferous, the broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, etc., have been shown to be very effective for um, uh, Alzheimer's prevention and delay of uh, cognitive decline. However, don't cheat, like this guy. Too much left. <laughs> Don't go on the meat and minimize the lettuce. What you have to do is emphasize the leafy greens. And the best ones that have been shown in trials, co cohort trials, are spinach, kale, collard, mustard. They have things like complex antioxidants, they have natural, simple antioxidants like vitamin A, C, and E. The B vitamins, which are very important for cognitive fiber and also select minerals. And the key thing, they're low in fat, sugar, and salt. The other things that are important, fish, especially fatty fish. And fatty fish tend to be the darker colored fish. That means they have higher fat levels, which means higher omega-3s. These are salmon, sardines, herring, anchovies, mackerel, tuna. Very high levels of omega-3 fats, vitamin D, vitamin B12, all very important for not only cognitive decline, but also for general health, selenium, and they're low in sugar and salt. And they're high in good fats. Fruits, I would focus on the berries. Cranberries, blackberries, blueberries, Blueberries are the highest among the berries in sugar content. Strawberries and blackberries are probably the lowest. Acai, elderberry, and kiwi, pomegranate. Grapes are, tend to be high. So I would, you know, if you want to really limit your sugar intake, I would pick uh, blackberries, strawberries, and raspberries. And they're very good sources of complex and simple antioxidants, manganese, fiber, vitamins, but not B12. B12 tends to come from animal sources, low fat and salt. The other food group, liquid fats and oils. I would go with extra virgin olive oil wherever you can. Why? Because um, first of all, not too refined or processed because they have found that if you increase the amount of olive oil in a Mediterranean diet, you decrease the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia tremendously, very significantly. Canola oil, high lake sunflower oil, also good in flaxseed oil, but not as good as the olive oil. These all contain the unsaturated fatty acids, which are good for you, complex antioxidants, and they're low in salt and cholesterol. Nuts and seeds, also very important. Also, there was a study that showed that increasing the nuts and seeds in a Mediterranean diet also decreases Alzheimer's gain. 
again, because they're rich in natural vitamin E. Almonds and sunflower seeds are the best sources for getting natural vitamin E. They're the highest level in foods. They have monounsaturated fatty acids, fiber, complex antioxidants. Beverages, I would focus on red wines. Be careful about the red wines. I would not go more than one cup a day of red wine. The reason for that is because any alcohol has been shown to be a risk factor for breast cancer too. So what people have sort of folk honed in on is that no more than one cup, because that gives you the best, it's a low risk of breast cancer, but gives you a, a, some potential for lowering uh, cognitive decline. Or you could go to coffee, tea, green or white, and vegetable smoothies. They also are very good for you because they have antioxidants, and the uh, smoothies have the full benefits of vegetables, low in fat, salt, and sugar. In whole grains, as though I tell you to limit the amount of carbs, the best ones are flaxseed, because it has um, uh, what they call plant omega-3s, not as good as fish omega-3s, but still okay. Quinoa, black rice, again, these are high in fiber and relatively lower in the carbs. Oats, barley, and buckwheat, all of these have had some factors that contribute to health. Foods that hurt the brain. Well, of course, I don't have to tell you, sweets and high carb foods, uh, these are the junk foods. High fat meats and dairy, red meats, beef, pork, cured meats, hamburgers, saturated fats, inflammatory proteins, excess iron, which causes oxidation. So I would stay away from that. High salt foods, same problem. Saturated fats and trans fats, stay, at this point, it's still controversial, but I would stay away from saturated fats and trans fats. Trans fats, you don't have to worry so much because the government has introduced regulations to limit the amount of trans fats in foods. So you don't have to worry about that. But with all these harmful effects, there still are some good qualities to these junk foods. Donuts, they're healthier than crystal meth. So that's an advantage. The more you weigh, the harder you are to kidnap. Stay safe, <laughs> eat cake. <laughs> okay, so now uh, we'll go into the diets and menu plans, but uh, do any of you have um, any, uh, questions. Hi, Ed. It's Mike again. Um, I have one question. When you have healthy foods like vegetables and, and fruits uh, that are very healthy and you eat them plain, as opposed to putting them in a smoothie and, you know, it, it's liquefied, is there any difference? You're getting, are you getting the same nutritional value? Are you getting the same fiber or are we losing something because we're not actually chewing it? Actually, in some cases, you're getting an improvement. And the reason is a lot of antioxidants in these vegetables are locked in with the fiber in the vegetable. So you don't get total absorption of the antioxidant when you digest it. You always get some carried over into your feces. So when you break it down like that, and I'll show you later uh, where I, I show you how to optimize the food processing, you can actually improve the quality of, uh, of the nutrients you get. Great, thank you. If you heat it, by the way, there's a problem because some of the antioxidants are susceptible to heat degradation, others are not. For example, a lycopene, which is a very important antioxidant, which is found in tomatoes, you don't get much absorption from the tomato itself because it's trapped in the matrix of the tomato. But when you make um, a tomato sauce or, uh, or you boil it or cook it, you get a lot more of the lycopene released. Great. Any other questions? Vivian, are you trying to say something? Yes, I am. I can't hear you. Can you You're hear free? me now? It says I am muted. I've been muted by the host. Oh. My, my um, I am unmuted here, but. Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Is there a difference between eating fresh fish and 
t and canned fish like tuna, salmon, sardines. No, both of them are good. You know, the There's... omega 3s are fairly stable. And uh, uh, whether you eat it uh, like a can of salmon or fresh salmon, uh, you're going to get pretty much the same amount of omega 3s. And the nice thing about the canned salmon is very versatile, very easy to prepare. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, are there any other questions? No, okay. Okay, so then we can go on. Resume slideshow. Good. Okay. Uh, we've covered all that. Okay, diets and menu plans. Okay, that's this is now we're taking all the foods that are good for you and trying to put it in a form that we can use. The different menu plans that I've got here going from level one to level four, they're all good for you. They all are healthy diets and they all will improve your heart health, your diabetes, uh, even cancer. But as we go up to level four, we incorporate more foods that have been shown specifically to help in preventing cognitive decline and developing Alzheimer's and dementia. So as you go from the top to the bottom, it's more detailed, but it also becomes more effective. The simplest way to do a menu plan, just eat real food. And Michael Poland said it himself. He says, eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. Perfect and eat the rainbow. What that means is eat colorful foods. Colorful foods mean they have antioxidants, whether it's purple or red or green, it's got antioxidants. So by the way, you know how come there's so many antioxidants in plants? Because plants consume a lot of oxygen to produce their carbohydrates or grow. In order to protect themselves from all that oxygen, they develop these antioxidants. And that's how you get so many in plants. So that's the first level. The next level is the Mediterranean diet, where we've had a lot of uh, experience with. In fact, it originally arose from experiments in uh, heart health. And they found that it was very beneficial for cardiac disease uh, improvement. But then they found it was very good for cognitive decline also. Beyond that, we developed the MIND diet a couple of years ago, which is a combination of Mediterranean plus DASH. DASH is a, um, was an original diet that focused on removing saturated fats from your diet. Anyway, combining the two, increase the amount of foods that are known to benefit uh, cognition. And then finally, the brain boosting diet, based on recent research, enhances and increases the amount of foods that you should eat like omega-3 fats from fish, based on their benefit. You don't have to worry, this is a busy slide, but basically you can look at it at your leisure later on. I, comp I compare the med diet, the mind diet, and the brain boosting diet, and I indicate what the menu plan is for each one of them with the differences in color. So I recommend high intake foods, for each of the diet plans. I indicate moderate intake foods and low intake. And again, as I say, the brain boosting diet is an improvement over the first two because of uh, the recent data on which foods contribute to cognition. So again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this gives you an idea of what you should put together as a menu plan. So how many servings a day of whole grains, vegetables, potatoes, fruits, et cetera. And legumes and nuts greater than six per week. So it, it gives you an idea. It doesn't give you a specific recipe. That's Noreen's job. And that's what we'll see soon. Uh, low intake. Okay, this is an important chapter. Uh, but before we go into it, uh, do we uh, pause? Pause here. Okay.
Well, it's not going away, but anyway, I put pause. Does anybody have any questions on the uh, menu plans? Okay, so we'll continue. This is a very interesting uh, set of tables. We look at the preparation category, how to combine foods, how to prepare them, and how to, and I give you the recommended preparation and examples. One is combining B vitamin rich foods with omega-3 rich foods. Why? It's interesting because there's been some inconsistency about how beneficial omega-3 fats are. But then they found out that when you combine omega-3s with the B vitamins, like B12 and B6, you get a synergistic effect and it enhances the functioning of the omega-3. So what I recommend is you eat leafy vegetables with fatty fish. Perfect. The other way of combining foods, combine carotenoid antioxidants containing foods with fat. Why? Because there are some antioxidants that are only soluble in fat. They're not soluble in water. So if you cook them and you serve them in a soup or something, they're trapped still in the matrix and you won't get absorption. But if you eat them with fat, they'll get dissolved in the fat and you'll be able to get the advantage of the carotenoids. So what I would do if I'm looking for antioxidants, I would combine water soluble and fat soluble and with fat soluble, eat with a fatty meal. So yams, spinach, carrots, tomatoes, which have carotenoids, eat with an oily salad dressing or butter, which is saturated fat. So uh, if you can avoid it and you like oily salad dressing, use that. They also found in preparations that you avoid monounsaturated fats when consuming omega-3 fats. The reason for that is you get competitive absorption in the body. So if you've got a lot of monounsaturated fats, the body won't absorb as much of the omega-3s. So if you leave those out, you get better absorption. So oily fats or salad dressing with fatty fish, you know, um, just use a little bit of it. This is an interesting one, is reducing digestible carbs. You can prevent the breakdown of um, carbs into glucose by choosing what they call resistant starch foods. All starches are bad. They're refined flours and they're all just glucose in the chain. So you try to avoid those. But if you must have them, there's ways of preventing their absorption. One is using large particle grains. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, beans, lentils, uh, things that are whole, because it's hard to get at all the carbs by breaking down the matrix. So that's one way to do it. Also, the less ripe the fruit is, the less digestible carbs. So Anita and myself, we always eat unripe bananas that are still green. They're a little bit soft and they're edible, but we don't let them ripen, so there's less sugar. And uh, we can slow carb digestion by uh, cooking, cooling the beans that forms resistant starch, lentils and cassava, and uh, by eating high carb foods with vinegar, fiber, and a fat, which minimizes or helps slow down the absorption. Finally, to maximize the antioxidant impact, spread your antioxidant intake over many plant sources. Eat a variety, eat a variety of, oops, what happened? Eat a variety of vegetables and fruits. Don't just stick to one. And by all means, do not buy supplements of antioxidants. These are just isolated antioxidants, which don't represent the full effectiveness of the antioxidants you find in foods. Uh, you can vary your preparation procedures. Like remember I mentioned cooked tomatoes, onions, and cabbage so that you can release the antioxidants. But steam cooks so you minimize degradation, other vegetables to minimize their degradation. Don't overcook or overprocess foods. Consume low-fat vegetables and fruit with oily salad dressing or nuts and cheese. 
and use light or medium roast coffees. They find that if you take the dark coffees, you don't have as much of an impact by antioxidants as a light or medium roast because some of the antioxidants are degraded. Okay, so that's uh, basically it on the combination of foods. Again, any questions? No, okay, we're almost done. Supplements, I don't recommend very many supplements. The only ones I recommend are B12 because first of all, as we get older, the B12 becomes deficient in elderly diets because you don't eat as much. And they only come from animal sources. And it, the thing is, in older people, B12 is very poorly absorbed. So when you take a supplement of B12, you, the reason it's poorly absorbed is, first of all, it has to be released from the food. And in older people, it's not as easily released. But the supplement is very effective because it's pure. It's a B12. So you get a better absorption. And because it's uh, mainly from animal foods. Vitamin D, also important. Uh, low vitamin D is associated with low cognitive decline. We know that it's deficient in the U.S. population. It's poor conversion in sunlight for elderly people, and animal foods are the main source. So that's the reason I recommend those. Curcumin is only only one uh, of a supplement that I've uh, recommended that you can buy because they found that in combination with vitamin D, it does help clear beta amyloids and improves memory, reduces risk and complication of diabetes and heart disease. It's a strong antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. But the interesting thing is curcumin is fat soluble and most people just take the tablets by themselves. So you have relatively poor absorption. But if you eat the curcumin with fats and also some of the new formulations which micronize them, you'll get enhanced absorption and better effect. Phosphatidylserine is the only other one I recommend. It's the only supplement that's approved by the FDA for a cognitive health thing. And there are many studies of short duration. By the way, it was originally discovered in Israel. It showed positive effects on cognition. Okay, so that's it for the science. I'm gonna go into the recipes just quickly, but are there any questions in the meantime? Okay, so Noreen has produced uh, each recipe, but she's done it very well because she has a section called Noreen Shares. Uh, she tells you some interesting facts about fish, uh, what kind of fish you should get, you know, and then she goes into the recipe itself and it gives you the culture parameters, parve, Passover, it's gluten free or makes four servings. Very effective. And then she gives you options. Well, first she tells you how to pro process it. We have the overall nutritional profile. And then options. How do you do it for one person? How do you do it with paper poached fish? Or chain use dill instead of basil? So she gives you very uh, a lot of um, information. And then I put in some interesting nutritional facts. So salmon is one of the best choices for getting omega-3 fats and provides 1.3 grams per serving. But it's also a good source of vitamin D and B12, which are difficult to get. And the romaine and dill are the leafy vegetables which continue the B6 and folate. And I have uh, interesting factoids, which as we discussed, combining omega-3 fats with B vitamins enhances the brain-saving effects. Okay, so that's an example of one of the recipes. I'll just give you an overview of what she's done. She has better breakfast with a whole bunch of recipes. Make it meatless, meatless recipes. Brainy grains, some of the better grains to use if you want carbs. Marvelous mains, the main dishes. Versatile, versatile vegetable and sides. Savvy salad dressing and marinades. Splendid spreads and starters. Fishful thinking, focusing on fish, super soups. She's covered the whole landscape, done an excellent job. Okay, so these are just appendices. Now, I've told you a lot about how um, 
dementia and Alzheimer's can ruin your old age. But there are some advantages to old age. And I wanted to end the lecture on a high note. So here's the advantages. I am a teenager, senior teenager. I have everything that I wanted as a teenager, only 60 years later. I don't have to go to school or work. I get an allowance every month. I have my own place. I don't have a curfew. I have a driver's license in my own car. My friends are not scared of getting pregnant and I don't have acne. Life is great. So there are some good things about getting older. Okay, that's it. Any uh, overall questions at all? Ed, that was yeah. an excellent lecture, an excellent overview, and it's a lot of food for thought. And now <laughs> you is that a pun? <laughs> and now you've made me very hungry. <laughs> Bola Kavod, it was a good lecture. Ed, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. Really fabulous. Okay. I'm glad you liked it. And um, uh, if you want to get more details, you've got the book, or you can uh, get the recording from uh, the Bethica website. Okay. Okay. So shall I?